This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. All the rest of them walked back in there. They never did say no more about her. They was just mad. You could see the anger on her face. Okay. Did you ever see her again? Not after that. I don't know what they done with her. Did, did, did you see her the next day? No. I don't even know what they done with her body. They just told me I'm one day if we opened up and said anything about what we seen, that they would kill us okay. and do the same thing to us. And we were scared, and I still am scared. Well, you don't need to be. You're safe. Around the time Kelly Wilson disappeared from the piney woods of East Texas, some country folks in Gilmer got in trouble with the law. The Kurs, often referred to as the Kerr clan. There were a bunch of them. A big, incestuous family living in shacks and trailers in a kind of rundown compound on Cherokee Trace the same winding road where search parties would eventually comb the woods for any sign of Kelly Wilson. The problems for the Kerrs started in the fall of 1990, when one of the brothers, this guy Wendell, left his wife Loretta for a younger woman. Loretta reported Wendell to the authorities, said he'd been abusing their four kids. The new woman in Wendell's life, her name was Wanda, she brought her own baggage. Wanda's brother Lucas was a molester too, He'd abused Wanda's kid from her previous relationship with a guy named Bad Jimmy. It was a tangled web. A caseworker from Child Protective Services stepped in. Yes, sir? Hey, my name is Wes Ferguson. I'm a a journalist. Uh I'm working on a project about the Kelly Wilson case and looking for Ann Gore. Is that you? That was Ann when I knocked. You'll hear about her throughout the series. Ann Gore, the caseworker, was a deeply religious woman from Gilmer. The abuse she uncovered was more than alarming. Thanks in part to Ann's efforts, Wendell and Lucas were arrested, and they both got 10 years probation. Less than a year after that slap on the wrist, Wendell and his new flame, Wanda, got married. Their wedding took place on the Kerr family compound on Cherokee Trace. Just days later, CPS filed to remove the kids from the home of the convicted sex offender. In court, Wanda also admitted that she had abused her own sons from infancy. It was all horrifying. By now, the investigation into the Kerrs had sprawled throughout the family. Allegations went up to the grandparents, Eugene and Geneva Kerr, a multi-generational legacy of incest and abuse. Some things about the case weren't just appalling, They were bizarre. One night, Anne took some of the Kerr kids to dinner. They had been singing and playing games on the drive back to Gilmer. One of the young girls became very quiet. All of a sudden, she got real serious. I want to know how Anne feels about Jesus. Then she said, do you like Jesus? This is recreated from an interview Anne gave in 1995 with Contact, an alternative newspaper. Anne declined to speak with me on the mic, so you're hearing from my friend Beverly, reading the voice of Anne. I said, yes, I like Jesus. And she told me she didn't like him, and I asked her, why? And she said, because he sexually abuses the angels. Anne was shocked. She asked, who in the world told you something like that? And she said, nobody told me that. I saw him do it. I was an angel. By now, there were more than a dozen Kerr kids and stepkids in foster care. One day, they all went to a birthday party. The children, strangely, began to chant around the candles on the cake. The youngest one said, the devil's coming. And he got his fingers all perched up in a claw-like form and said, he scratched me and he get blood. Hearing this now, sure, it's kind of dark, 
but mostly it just sounds like silly kids who might have watched a scary movie or two. This child was only three years old, though. By now, Anne was highly attuned to other disturbing things the kids were talking about. As the children kept opening up to Anne and their foster parents, the stories became more gruesome, more explicit. Eating body parts, drinking blood. Child trafficking, demonic rituals, killing babies in the woods. The worst crimes were rumored to be happening at the Kerr Place off the dark trail of Cherokee Trace. Anne and her caseworker colleague, Debbie Minshew, knew how to handle child abuse claims. Sadly, those were all too common. The Satan stuff, though, that was beyond their scope. That's when CPS brought in a state cop, Steve Baggs, to take over the Kerr case. Baggs had been involved in some recent investigations of murderous cults, and he was about to retire from the Texas Department of Public Safety. Needing backup, Baggs turned to a police chaplain from Louisiana named Brooks Flagg, who fashioned himself an expert on satanic rituals. Bags and Flag, the dynamic duo. They interrogate Wanda's brother, Lucas, who admits to being part of a group that sacrificed children and babies. To prove he's telling the truth, Lucas even takes a lie detector test. He told several girls that they had kidnapped, tortured and raped and eventually killed. And he passed the polygraph exam with flying colors. That's Melvin Dodd a Gilmer school teacher at the time. Melvin would become a key player in the Kelly Wilson saga. You'll hear plenty from Melvin in this episode. During a search of the Kerr place, cadaver dogs alerted on a particular shed in the backyard. And it had shackles in there where you could, uh, you know, like handcuff somebody to the wall. And there were cat and nine tail whips in there and all kinds of satanic stuff. The shed made the local news. At a storage shed belonging to the Kerr family is in the hands of investigators tonight. Police are keeping mum about where the shed is and what they'll do with it. But forensic experts believe the shed will undergo a battery of extensive tests for evidence. Partial listing of what they found inside and are labeling as evidence inside the shed, a pickup truck toolbox also found on the floor and walls of the shed were hair. Hair was also found in a wood rail and rope, and there was a cat of nine tails made of metal. The investigators were closing in, building their case. From Imperative Entertainment, I'm Wes Ferguson. This is Devil Town. This is Chapter 3, In the Woods. Talking to folks in Gilmer, I keep hearing whispers about the Kerr family, about Sergeant Brown, other prominent names that come up repeatedly, and I'm trying to check out all of them. Hardly anybody wants to talk on the record, and I can't say I blame them. But there's an exception, John Melvin Dodd, the retired schoolteacher. Several Gilmer residents who wouldn't put their own names out there said I should try him instead. Seeing as Melvin is a charter member of the Justice for Kelly Wilson Committee, which we'll get to soon enough. So, I called Melvin. Here's a man who speaks his mind. I tell you what, you're taking on a project. I hope you make some money out of it. Because you're taking on a monstrous project. I thought about writing a book about it myself, but gosh, I never did, and I'm 80 years old, and I'm not going to now, but I guarantee you, I'll be very happy to help you. Really and truly, we're we're just kind of scratching the surface. Back to that shed in the Kerr's backyard. Shackles and whips? From what I've read, it was more like straps and ropes, some rubber tie-downs, an insulated electrical wire, and that cat and nine tails, which is a little weird. At any rate, the investigators also discovered a long trail looping through the woods behind the house, which they saw as some kind of ritualistic footpath, and they thought it might be home to shallow graves. By now, the case had expanded beyond the Kerr family. Wanda's sons claimed that one of the neighbor kids had also been involved in the abuse, this seven-year-old kid named Raymond. Normally, I wouldn't name a minor victim like this, 
but Raymond gave the okay. CPS took Raymond and his little brother, who was just a toddler at the time, and placed them in foster care. Their foster mom was named Barbara Bass. She had a ton of kids in her care. She had been the East Texas foster parent of the year, I think the year before, and she had been given custody of Raymond Smith during this, and so she and Ann Gore and Debbie Minshew took Raymond to the Dairy Queen. And while Raymond is there eating, he casually says, I know what happened to Kelly Wilson. Seven-year-old Raymond claimed the Kurs had abducted Kelly Wilson, the local girl that hadn't been seen at this point in a year and a half. And not only that, he said, the Kurs, they'd killed her. That's how all of this started. Raymond Smith told about how they would go out there and they'd beat uh, Kelly and they raped her and all this kind of stuff. And there were other kids, mostly girls, who were brought in by the truck drivers in the family and they would do this to them and they'd kill them. Ann Gore and her fellow caseworker, Debbie Minshew, shared Raymond's claims with Gilmer Police Sergeant James York Brown, who'd been leading the unrelated, so far, search for Kelly. James Brown is the policeman who was assigned to investigate. So they took it to James Brown. Well, two or three days later, they hadn't even heard from James Brown. So they go see James Brown. And he told them, you stay out of my case. If you don't, I will destroy you and I'll destroy the kid. To be honest, it's hard for me to comprehend that James Brown ever said this, but it's pretty much exactly how Ann Gore has described their exchange in that interview she gave for Contact Newspaper. Brown, it seems, wanted no one coming close to his investigation. By now, the investigation into the Kurs was really heating up. It was August 93, going into September. The Kurs were heading toward a criminal trial on dozens of sex abuse charges. I got a phone call from, I believe it was Ann Gore, who was with the Child Protective Services. She um, told me that they had a bunch of molestation cases involving um, an extended family in Gilmer, the Kurs, uh, as well as some other folks who were associated with them. This is Shane Phelps. At the time, he was an assistant attorney general for the state of Texas. Shane had just been named the chief of a brand new division in the AG's office set up to assist local prosecutors when they need extra help. So I asked her, you know, what kind of cases are we talking about? When are they going to trial? Uh, Because this is the kind of thing we did. I mean, the attorney, the district attorney in that jurisdiction, Upshur County, uh, apparently discovered that he had a conflict. And so he, at almost at the last minute, said, I I can't handle these cases. As it turned out, there were some 45 indictments involving about six or seven people, which is a ton of cases. I mean, that's an extraordinarily complex and difficult case to prepare and get to trial or trials. So when I asked her, well, when is this thing set for trial? As I recall, it was very quickly. It wasn't the next week, but it was very quickly was on the trial docket already. It may have been a month out. And I, I just said, look, I've got a capital murder case I'm handling right now. I'm staffing this office. Um, I'm just taking over. We just can't take um, that case uh, of that magnitude on at this, at this time. Was there anything about the satanic stuff at that point? None. No, it was just uh, molestation, sexual assault, indecency with a child involving these children. She didn't give me any details, and she certainly didn't mention anything at all about the satanic stuff. Um, She did mention that they had made contact with a uh, lawyer named Scott Lyford. I think he was out of Galveston. He was a civil lawyer. Scott Lyford was indeed a civil lawyer, but he'd worked on child abuse cases earlier in his career. With Shane Phelps unable to help, Lyford was appointed special prosecutor. The first thing he did was appoint Bags and Flag as special prosecutors. Next, Bags and Flag got named special investigators for the sheriff's office too. And just like that, the team had real power. 
power to unravel the story. It is about five minutes until six on uh, Thursday, December the 9th, 1993. We're with Connie Martin. Uh, also here is Debbie Minshew, uh, Steve Baggs, Brooke Flagg, and myself, Scott Lyford. Uh, we've been talking to Connie Martin on and off uh, most of the afternoon. Her lawyer's here in the jail and has visited with her on several occasions. And uh, we're going to go over again some things now that she just told us and uh, gotten off her chest. Steve, I'll let you y'all pick up where you are. Okay, Connie, where are you where are you want to start? You want to start at, at the Trace or at, at NTV where she was picked up? Connie Martin. She was the common law wife of Danny Kerr. When a bunch of the Kerrs were getting rounded up, Connie was arrested too. You heard Connie at the top of this episode. Here she is again, talking with Steve Baggs about the abduction of Kelly. Kelly got in this van, a white van with us at NTV. Well, it's right beside the video place. Mm -hmm. We went from there out to uh, Geneva's house on Cherokee Trace. Danny and all of them was, we was all sitting in the kitchen. I was sitting beside Kelly. They asked Kelly if she, Danny and Wendell had asked Kelly if she wanted to go outside. And she said yes, so they followed her out the door. According to Connie, Kelly had been friends with Danny Kerr. So it wasn't strange for her to get into Danny's van or for her to visit the Kerr's house. In the woods, Connie said they were coerced into group sex. After they made us do that, they made us, me and Wanda put our clothes back on, made us take the children back to the house. Did you ever see her again? Not after that, I don't know what they did with her. Did, did you see her the next day? No. I don't know what they don't tell about her. They just told me and wondered if we opened up and said anything about what we seen, that they would kill us. They are very violent people. You ever seen anybody else? No. But they have threatened to kill me. If I open my mouth, they have threatened to kill Wanda. I have seen marks on Wanda's throat. And I asked Wanda what happened to her throat, and she wouldn't tell me. I don't know if she was scared to tell me or what. We heard about Wanda earlier. She's the wife of Wendell Kerr, and she'd already confessed to abusing her own sons. The Lifer team grilled Wanda for hours. Eventually, she cracked. The team even escorted her out of jail so she could show them around the Kerr place where their heinous crimes supposedly went down. Wanda said Kelly was a birthday present for Geneva, the matriarch of the Kerr clan. She said Danny and a few of the other Kerr family members pulled up beside the movie store and Kelly came over to their van. Here's Wanda with investigator Steve Baggs. The story she tells is kind of similar to her sister-in-law, Connie's. Did she lean in the window? No, she just stood there. Okay. What did Danny say? Danny asked her, would you, uh, do you, uh, would you like to go out and meet my mother, Geneva? And uh, then what did uh, Kelly say? Kelly said, okay, sure. Wanda said the van took Kelly to the Kerr compound on Cherokee Trace. Everybody gathered around Geneva's kitchen. How long were you there before the conversation got to the van? A few minutes. Danny told Kelly that his mom wants to talk to her. And Kelly went over there. As mom asked me if uh, she would take her clothes off, she said no. And that's where the argument started. She was stunned. She was what? Stunned. Stunned. Uh, yeah, in other words, didn't know what was going on. Somebody spoke up and said it was just a joke. It was just picking on you. And asked, would you like to go outside and walk around and sort of cool off a little bit? Who went out the door first? I did. Out the door, and then who came out behind you? Kelly. She was right there behind. Which door did you go out? The back door. Back door. Always back door. Stood outside. Right there at the back uh, back steps. Till everybody got out there, then it was just like walking around. It started out towards the. Uh, the peace trees, it's out there, uh, past the clothesline a little bit. 
Janae will want to show her her peach trees. The one she planted. Janae will want to show her peach trees. Right. Want to show her peach trees. To me, it seemed like it was just time to get her mind occupied. That's what it seemed like to me. Kelly and the Kerrs ended up deeper in the woods. At this point in the interview, Steve Baggs asks Wanda about the names of other people who were over there that night. Then the recording ends. So, while Baggs and Flagg are doing their thing, you gotta remember that Sergeant James York Brown is still heading up the original search for Kelly Wilson. Although Sergeant Brown was initially dismissive of the Kerr connection, he went ahead and interviewed Wanda's brother Lucas. Remember, Lucas had told Baggs and Flagg that he'd been part of the cult that sacrificed babies and children. He'd even passed a polygraph. Now, though, Lucas had a different story. He told Sergeant Brown that he'd made all that up. Brown also talked to Wendell Kerr. According to the special prosecutor's star witnesses, Wendell had been on the scene when the Kerrs kidnapped Kelly. The way they told it, he was practically the ringleader of the devil cult. But Wendell was a truck driver. He'd been hauling freight on the East Coast on the night Kelly Wilson disappeared from the video store in Gilmer, Texas, and Wendell had the receipts to prove it. Brown took his findings to Scott Lyford. Now it was Lyford's turn to be dismissive. If the Kerrs were capable of demonic sacrifices, they were capable of anything, and that includes the relatively simple task of forging a bunch of receipts. Sergeant James Brown wasn't buying it. He wouldn't back down. I mean, I knew they had falsified information and falsified evidence and stuff in those child cases that they were in on at the time. That's Sergeant Brown. Just to be clear, he's accusing the Lifer team of falsifying evidence here. I'm not aware of them doing that. Lots of different interpretations, though. And I told him that when he went to court, I was going to testify against them. And as it built up, he turned around and threatened me that he would ruin me and destroy my livelihood and everything else, politically and all. Of course, I didn't think he could do it. But when they lied about those things, and then they lied about the evidence, you know, as I said, when you falsify evidence, you make up evidence and you present it to somebody like a grand jury, they don't know what they did do and didn't do. And that's the sad part about it. They lied completely. And then that's how they, as the guy says, sucked me into it because they said, well, if we can get him killed, it's the way I looked at it, then they walk away as white knights. Wait, was the lifer team trying to kill Sergeant Brown? I think he means they were trying to kill his case. Rival investigations were heading straight toward a collision. On the one hand, there was Scott Lyford with investigators Bags and Flag joined by caseworkers Ann Gore and Debbie Minshew. And on the other, Sergeant James Brown, keeping his version of the case to himself. Meanwhile, CPS had to do something with all those Kerr kids. Some of the kids went with Barbara Bass, the foster parent of the year, who I mentioned earlier in the episode. Others ended up with an older couple named James and Marie Lappy. James and Marie were actually so afraid of the Kerr family, they fled with their 10 foster kids to the West Texas town of Colorado City, trying to put a ton of distance between themselves and the supposed devil cult in Gilmer. James and Marie built a tall fence to keep the kids in. They homeschooled the kids and even brought in this guy Dan Sullivan to teach Sunday school. And it became clear to Dan Sullivan that the children had been deprived. She said that... that uh that they had been through so much and she wanted to give them a treat with moving and all the stress and everything and she was going to take them all to the grocery store and let them get whatever they wanted as a treat to eat and they went to the dog food section that was their that a treat to them was she afraid of having the children interact with other children when they first came to colorado city yes 
Why? Absolutely. Because the children were taught to to abuse other children and hurt and maim other children. She told us that they knew the older boys knew how to kill and field dress a baby. A baby? A baby. Yes, sir. Of the dozen or more Kerr kids placed in foster care, one was a seven-year-old boy named Danny Kerr Jr. In November 1993, his foster dad, James Lappy, slapped Danny in the face and repeatedly slammed his head against the wooden floor of their home. Other foster kids who witnessed the assault described the back of Danny's head in gruesome detail. Here's Shane Phelps again describing the injury. My understanding was that there was a blow to his head or a series of blows to his head that basically reduced his head to mush. I mean, it was, it was a horrible injury. The same day he injured Danny Jr., James Lappy wrote a note claiming that he had merely fallen on the child while admitting, quote, if that boy dies, it will be my fault. James Lappy then shot himself to death in his own backyard. James's wife, Marie, was next to die. Two days later, in his office at the Colorado City Record, reporter Wade Warren was listening to his police scanner. Uh, there was a 911 call at the same address. So I went up there and uh, found the, I got there right after the police department did, and then the JP, and uh, found, uh, you know, found that he had committed, apparently committed suicide with an overdose of a uh, pill, prescription drugs. Awful. As for poor Danny Jr., he was left severely impaired. From what I understand, he never recovered, spending the rest of his days in assisted living. Danny Jr. died in 2011 at the age of 24. Okay, I know I've thrown a lot of names at you. Here's another. Tammy Manis. Tammy was a bus driver for the Kerr kids when they were in foster care. I was driving a school bus in uh, 1992 for Gilmer Independent School District, and I had some children on my bus, small children, and uh, mentioned something to the effect of knowing what had happened to Kelly Wilson. And I called and reported that to Sergeant Brown that evening. Uh, I never heard anything back. Uh, Sergeant Brown didn't seem that concerned as to where the children lived at that time. And as the, as the case progressed, you know, there was really nothing until January of this year, whenever he was indicted. So Tammy was already suspicious of Sergeant Brown. When she got her hands on some secret documents provided to the grand jury, she saw a cover-up. So Tammy got together with our friend Melvin, the Gilmer school teacher, and yet another investigative team was born. I barely knew Tammy. She had driven the school bus that my kids rode on. We called it the Justice for Kelly Wilson Committee. And the oldest and the youngest Kerrs were members of our committee, uh, daughters. Two of the Kerr sisters were both adults when all this was going down. They declined to speak with me, but I did read a couple of interviews they gave back in the 90s where they claimed to have been abused by their family members. Marie Kerr even talked at a couple of news conferences. My parents and my brothers put me through the same thing that these kids are saying, and I don't, I want to protect my nieces and nephews. This is why I'm fighting so hard. Again, quote, my parents and my brothers. And, you know, the both said, well, well this, all this child molestation was going on. We underwent it. Uh, there's satanic worship. Uh, every bit of this is so. And, yes, they did kidnap and murder Kelly Wilson. So we, we wound up meeting, interviewing dozens of people. And... You know, when you're doing this, most of the people were involved in drugs themselves. That's why they knew about all of this. Nobody was ever interested in what we were told. They were totally uninterested in what we were looking for because they were trying to cover up what was going on and trying to blame Chris Denton for her murder. Chris Denton, you may remember, was a boyfriend of Kelly's. We'll take a closer look at him later. James Brown saw Chris as a prime suspect, and that was going to be the focus of the investigation he was running. 
At first, it seems like Kelly's mom, Kathy, was inclined to go along with that hunch. James Brown. T- Kathy totally trusted because James Brown was coming by her house every day, two, three, telling her leads that he had, how he was investigating these, and she just had total confidence in James Brown. Kathy changed her mind, though, when details from the interrogation of Connie Martin began to come out. Connie Martin just sang like a bird, and she started giving details. Connie really noticed things and would mention things that the average person probably wouldn't. For example, Connie was said to have noticed a particular detail about the rugby shirt that Kelly was wearing on the night she disappeared. She described the shirt she was wearing, and she said it had rubber buttons on it. Kathy knew then Connie Martin was telling the truth because she was wearing a rugby shirt, and rugby shirts have rubber buttons on them. Kathy knew that there was no way in the world Connie Martin would come up with that detail unless Connie Martin was there. So she knew right then that James Brown had been lying all this time. So that's when Kathy Carlson joined with Tammy and Glenn Leach and me. Kathy was now a member of the Justice for Kelly Wilson group. Glenn was another member who was really good at research. Melvin says the group kept hearing whispers about James Brown. I wasn't able to confirm them, but the rumors were certainly flying around Gilmer. At one point, the Justice for Kelly Wilson group got their hands on the security camera footage from the bank, where someone had made the deposit after Kelly's shift at the video store. Now, I've got a double first cousin whose son was an Apple computer freak at this time. He was into all kinds of graphics crazy looking pictures and everything like that but boy he was a guru when it came to using an apple computer a double cousin is when two siblings from one family marry two siblings from another family and both couples have kids the son of melvin's double cousin was able to enhance the video quality revealing more detail a van pulled in there And a man got out and made a deposit. And this man, I guarantee you, was James Brown in a Gilmer police uniform. Now, James Brown always wore real dark sunglasses, day and night. There's no question. It was James Brown. Well, now, this was an old enough fan that... The side windows were just clear glass. You know, nowadays, even the side windows are so dark, it's hard to see anybody in there. But there was an old woman sitting right behind James Brown, and she put her face up to the clear glass of the window, and it was Geneva Kerr, the old lady. I'm still trying to get my hands on the security footage so I can make up my own mind on this one. But Kathy also found it suspicious that James Brown had refused to take part in a citizen search she'd organized on the Cherokee Trace the month after her daughter went missing. Was the proximity to the Kerr home just too close for comfort? My husband and I had conducted a citizen search in February of 92, shortly after Kelly disappeared with many, many, many of the townspeople going with us and participating which was outside the city limits, and we asked Sergeant Brown, why can't you help us on this? And he said, it's outside my jurisdiction. He wouldn't go on that particular search, which was the closest to the the Kerr residence, where they found, where Lyford's team found some evidence, human hair, human blood. Melvin also deduced the Kerr's motives for their alleged crimes based on something he believes Connie Martin said when being grilled by bags and flag. Connie Martin talked about watchers in the woods. Uh, Out in the woods where they had this, it was greatly worn down. And they had people who were allowed to come there, but there were others who would just watch from the woods. And we interviewed several people who were watchers in the woods and seeing all these satanic rituals take place. And of course, it's just like... You know, I used to just be amazed at the children of Israel in the Old Testament, 
how, why did they so easily, so quickly revert back to paganistic worship? Well, flip about the major draw was it was all of the sex they had. And that's the draw of the satanic rituals is all the sex they have. Meanwhile, the Lifer team was also making headway in its parallel investigation of the Kurs, which now included Sergeant Brown. Bags and Flag took several statements from Gilmer residents who claimed to have seen James Brown or a police officer who looked like him with various members of the Kerr family while excavating another clearing where the ritual sacrifices supposedly took place, they found a piece of bone in the dirt. Lab testing suggested it was from the leg of a sub-adult human, as in, maybe Kelly. The deeper they dug into the case, the more the Lifer team was getting spooked. One night, they were having dinner when the phone rang. The only sound on the other end of the line was of a baby crying, which they found really disturbing. The Lifer team ended up going into hiding, setting up headquarters at an undisclosed location in the country, way outside of town. Remember, the Lifer team is just five people, a couple of social workers, a retired state cop and police chaplain, and a civil lawyer. They desperately needed backup. At some point, Scott called me, Scott Lifer, and I had a long conversation with him and told him, here's the, you know, my home number. Um, in my office number. This is Shane Phelps again with the Attorney General's office. Call me. If there's anything you need at all, I'll be glad to help you. Because it was pretty clear to me that he had limited experience in prosecution at the time. But just based on our conversation, it sounded to me like he needed help, which is why I, I offered it. It was a sincere offer. So he called me at one point, and I, I talked him through some of the complexities of handling those kind of cases. and particularly on the criminal side, and offer our assistance. If you need anything at all, call any time. We'll make ourselves available to you. That was in the fall of 93. One morning in January, Shane was flipping through the day's news clippings when a story caught him by surprise. KLTV Channel 7. This is East Texas News at 6. Arraignments today in the case of a missing Gilmer team. Good evening. Thanks for joining my next recollection of of becoming involved in the Gilmer case was, um, I think it was in January of, of that next year, which would have been 94. I saw this article about an indictment of all of these uh, people, the Kerrs. I noticed Scott Leifert's name. I said, well, that's peculiar, because it was talking about indicting all these people for death penalty offenses. Um, I think it was capital murder, aggravated sexual assault, aggravated kidnapping. And uh, I mentioned Kelly Wilson. I had no hint of, I didn't even know who Kelly Wilson was at this time. Um, so I, I kind of raised my eyebrows. I was, I wonder what's going on in Gilmer. Within days, a state politician from Gilmer named Bob Glaze was reaching out to the AG's office asking for help. Team Lyford wasn't just coming after Sergeant Brown anymore. Lyford and crew were setting their sights on anyone who stood in their way, including the town's bigwigs. Gilmer's civic leaders were embarrassed, and they wanted this case to go away. Shane Phelps's immediate supervisor asked him to take another look. The nature of the request was, you know, we need somebody to come in here and stop what's going on, because their perception was that Upshur County and Gilmer particularly were being made a laughing stock across the country. That was the first time I got the hint that there was anything about, you know, satanic covens and things like that. And obviously that was so far afield of, of the original conversation I had with, with Ann Gore. On the flight from Austin to Gilmer, Shane read a report about the case. The report didn't say who it was written by, but Shane has always assumed the author was Scott Lyford, the special prosecutor. And it was pretty wild. It told this, this tale of the satanic coven that was operating in Upshur County, and they were, they were kidnapping teenage hitchhike, hitchhiker girls. They were, they were sacrificing babies. They were, they were in cannibalism. I mean, it was just wild. And there was just enough in there that I thought, oh God, if any of this is true, this is insane. If reading about the case was insane, 
Just wait till he landed in Gilmer. That's next time on Devil Town. Devil Town is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was written and created by me, Wes Ferguson. Executive producer is Jason Hoke. Audio engineering and editing by Shane Freeman and Jason Hoke. Original score is by Robert Ellis. Recording by Austin Sisler at Eastside Studios. If you like the show, leave a review and don't forget to tell your friends. Thanks for listening.